Hello and welcome to the Superposition Guys podcast. My name is Yuval, and my guest today is Clarice Ayello, faculty at the UCLA Electrical Engineering Department. Clarice and I spoke about her work in quantum biology, nature-made quantum sensors and their potential macroscopic biological impact, explored the possible influence of weak magnetic fields on cellular function, a future where personalized magnetic fields could be used for specific health needs, and much more. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Hello, Clarice, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Yuval. I've recently become a fan of, of your podcast, so I'm happy to be here and to be talking to the quantum enthusiast. Wonderful. So who are you and what do you do? So, um, I am faculty uh, in electrical engineering uh, at UCLA, trained as a quantum uh, engineer. Uh, I work uh, on, if you're curious, uh, in the past, I worked uh, with technological quantum sensors. Uh, I am sure uh, a lot of people here in this podcast knows, but um, you can actually prove that if you use a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. So that's what I used to do uh, up to, say, six years ago. But at some point, I realized that uh, nature itself was producing sensors that uh, all the time overperformed humankind made sensors. And it turns out that there's evidence that some of those sensors are bona fide nature made quantum sensors. So I work uh, in a field, uh, an emerging field uh, that is called quantum biology, that aims to uh, establish the extent to which endogenous or native quantum mechanical degrees of freedom uh, in biology influences macroscopic biological function. I'm uh, an experimentalist, instrumentalist by training, so I build machines to study and control uh, those degrees of freedom, quantum degrees of freedom in biological matter, in the same way that you would control those quantum degrees of freedom, say, <laughs> inside, inside non-living matter. How about an example? So what biological process do, do you think, or does the, does the um, academia think at the moment, is influenced by a quantum process? Okay, I am sure you, you and a lot of folks here might have heard about the poster children of this field called quantum biology. Two post, very famous poster children of this field is photosynthesis and birds. So I don't care about photosynthesis, I don't care about birds, but... but they have the big advantage that they they shifted this conversation from biology and chemistry to physics. So uh, photosynthesis works better than any humankind made uh, solar cell. And uh, now there is uh, correlative evidence. I'll talk a little bit about the evidence in a second, but there's correlative evidence that it hel- it, it works by um, employing some type of uh, noise-assisted quantum process at w- in which uh, phonons actually help the transport of the, the, the energy of the photon that absorbed by plants from the, the, the place where the photon is absorbed until the place where this energy gets dumped. Um, the second uh, poster child of quantum biology is again birds. Birds uh, have been known for more than 50 years to navigate using, uh, at least as a partial cue, the magnetic field of the Earth that is known, uh, well, w- which is like orders of magnitude smaller than the magnetic field produced by your cell phone. So today, uh, the standing hypothesis on how they do this is by employing a type of, uh, and I'm going to, to be repeating this a lot of times, to, to by employing a type of electron spin dependent chemical reaction. So if that's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit what I mean. Uh, in uh, test tube chemistry, there is absolutely no doubt that that's what's going on in certain chemical reactions. This has been also undoubtedly known. So here's the deal. Um, in certain chemical reactions, there's a chemical reaction happening, and at some point, the chemical reaction comes to a crossroads. At that point, the chemical reaction effectively looks for the electron spin of a particular electron, and if the spin is up, or when I talk to physicists, I, I say if the spin is measured by the environment to be up, the chemical reaction continues to one path. If the spin is down, or measured by the environment to be down, the chemical reaction continues to another path. 
Importantly, the macroscopic final products of those two distinct paths are also distinct. So there is no doubt that spin degrees of freedom very finicky um, actually uh, influence the macroscopic final products of a chemical reaction. Now, if at the point that this chemical reaction is at this crossroads, this elect all important electron spin uh, sees, interacts, senses a nearby magnetic field, there happens a process that is effectively indistinguishable from what uh, quantum physicists would call quantum sensing. The electron spin uh, relies on superposition to sense this magnetic field, and this magnetic field will alter the probability of the spin being up or down. It's in this sense that the magnetic field via this quantum knob also can alter the probability that one chemical path is taken or the other one. And uh, this, uh, whereas uh, th there is no doubt that this is what happens in test tube chemistry, the cool thing is that um, birds, uh, for example, seem to respond to magnetic fields in a way that is consistent with this type of spin-dependent, superpos superposition, electron superposition-dependent chemical reaction being active under physiological conditions inside the birds somewhere. Right? And uh, one cool thing that you need to know before I stop talking about birds is that um, it's well understood in the spin physics of, of those chemical reactions in test tube that um, the magnitude of the effect of the magnetic field being sensed or the magnetic field being changed paths is not monotonically increasing or decreasing with magnetic field strengths for reasons that are well understood and that for the experts have to do with like how the external magnetic field compares to nearby hyperfine interactions of this electron spin, just for the expert. Uh, the magnetic fields that can actually alter uh, the the macroscopic fate of chemical reactions are relatively small, on the order of the magnetic field of the Earth, on the order of the magnetic field produced by your cell phone. This also means that if you put the magnetosensitive proteins inside, like the three Tesla of a magnetic resonance imager in, in a hospital, the big three Tesla is not going to make a difference. The magnetic fields that make a difference are relatively small. So, uh, and the idea is that then birds and other organisms in general are reacting to magnetic fields to the extent that they are reacting to the different physiological concentrations of products coming from these electron spin dependent chemical reactions. Now, I don't care about birds. All I care is that uh, for more than 40 years, uh, there is a wealth of, unfortunately, not very systematic data that shows that uh, cellular function is macroscopically altered by weak magnetic fields in a way that is also consistent with this type of spin-dependent chemical reaction going on. And this ranges from uh, DNA repair yields, regulation of cellular oxidants, uh, regulation of cellular metabolism, regulation of cellular respiration, up and down regulation of cellular proliferation, so um, what I care about is trying to uh, understand deterministically uh, this quantum knob that we might have in, in this uh, spin degree of freedom that happens in a wealth of different uh, electron spin dependent that seem to be happening inside cells and understanding whether we can uh, control those towards uh, some sort of uh, uh, altering physiological course, for example, for future therapeutics and the like. So this is basically what I do. Oof, that was long. I want to make the distinction between the microscopic and the macroscopic, because when you started yes. talking about chemical reactions at the atomic level, that's where quantum effects happen. But then you spoke about birds that are, of course, much larger objects. Yes. How is that connection made between an electron spin in a bird to the bird knowing where to that is the problem. It's very hard to study that. It's very so evidence nowadays exists in test tube chemistry, and the next level of evidence is like for birds, for plates of thousands of cells, for uh, like little organisms. There is no unambiguous confirmation or refute. There is just correlative data that those things seem to be uh, 
driven by this type of spin dependent chemical reaction under the hood. For example, in the bird, it's uh, uh, th th there's an idea of what the uh, protein that can sustain this type of spin dependent chemical reactions might be, but it's very hard to to map this causal network, right? How does there's a spin dependent chemical reaction that is probably altering protein conformation at the the micro level. How how does that translate to birds going right or left in the end? It's not known, and that's a problem, right? So this is why uh, in our lab, what we're developing um, are experiments that that bridge those two land scales. We are uh, still building the experiments, but where we want to go is trying to start studying this type of uh, spin-dependent chemical reaction, say, inside a single cell, and at the same time, read out, by a technique that I can explain in a second, read out uh, how um, spins inside cells react to magnetic fields at very brief time scales, and how this spin uh, preparation translates downstream into like cellular uh, differences in cellular physiological phenomena using regular fluorescence microscopy techniques that, that people in biology have been using for decades. It's like in the same experiment, being able to initialize, manipulate, and, and read out uh, spin degrees of freedom. And uh, once we learn how to do this, map out how those things are connected, how if we prepare a spin in a particular way, manipulate with magnetic fields, we can uh, manipulate or not uh, in a way consistent with this theory of uh, things that happen at the cellular level. So uh, our experiments that we were building, they really look like uh, they're glorified microscopes with coils, uh, but they are synchronized down to the nanosecond. So it's really what you would find in a quantum sensing-like lab that but our sample is is biological, right? We work with proteins in the near future with cells, for example. The magnetic field of the Earth is fairly constant, certainly in direction and magnitude. So I have two questions. One, do you recommend in your home, do you have a weak magnetic field because it's helpful? Uh, in, <laughs> and, and the second one, how does the dynamic behavior of the field, in your opinion, um, change the impact? So it's it's so that then again it's crazy. That's the, the point. The answer to to your question is it's crazy. Um, so first of all, the magnetic field of the Earth is not that constant. Uh, the magnetic field of the Earth, I think, it varies between thirty and sixty microtesla, more or less, and that already makes a difference. And birds uh, also seem to 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 um, to track. The, the direction of the magnetic field. So in the model, uh, and, and again, those things you can model with tools from quantum physics, like the tools from open quantum system in very simple ways. And those models already account for what happens in chemical reactions in test tubes. And there is a dependence on the model on magnetic field direction, frequency, and intensity, right? Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that if you grow cells, uh, grow stuff uh, under very good Faraday cages, you mess up with biology big time. So I have a friend. Uh, his name is Peter Fierlinger. He is a, a researcher at the, the TU Munich. He's like a bona fide precision measurement physicist. What he does is for a living, he builds very good Faraday cages with all sorts of like passive active compensations. And uh, what then he does is he shoves ultra cold atom experiments inside uh, because you don't want uh, like the magnetic field of the earth to, to alter those experiments. So he started hearing about those things of like, oh, magnetic field effects in biology. So uh, biologists convinced him to, to do an experiment in his lab. So here's what he did. So uh, in his chamber, so magnetic field of the earth, about 50 microtesla. Uh, inside his chambers, DC level of magnetic field about one or to two nanotesla, so very very small. Uh, he grew tadpoles for two days under two, and this has been reproduced by by other groups, and this seems to to, to stand. It's really really crazy if you see the data. Um, if you grow tadpoles like frog embryos for two days inside those chambers, 
one with a control where you apply a tiny magnetic field of the Earth. Like the Earth inside, the tadpoles after two days are, are okay. Uh, in the other experiment, he grows the tadpoles just under like nanotesla level magnetic fields. You see like 40, 30 to 40 percent of uh, embryo uh, mouth formation in that the embryos get all deformed and are no longer viable. Uh, there are other, there's other research saying that if you if you grow cells by without the magnetic field of the Earth, uh, you, you change epigenetics. You change like the this type of uh, the, like biological process uh, involved in how cells evolve or something. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm the best person to to explain epigenetics. But you one seems to be changing physiology big time and uh, this opens up all sorts of questions starting with maybe space exploration right so can you reproduce in mars can you do space farming in mars the the magnetic field of mars is very weak so how do we do this and that's something that i have actually been trying to, to tell nasa for some time now that it's not only microgravity it's not only like uh, cosmic radiation, we need to be thinking about different magnetic fields. How oh, and, 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 and magnetic fields. And, and, and no, I would not uh, be worried about magnetic fields from the environment. So here's the deal. Uh, the magnetic field specificity seems to be very large. Like each chemical reaction depends very precisely on being tuned by a certain magnetic field frequency and intensity, right? So it would be very bad luck if your cell phone manufacturer really hit that sweet spot to either make your cells behave worse or better, right? Which is the, the crazy part. By just changing a small magnetic field, you can up and down regulate processes. Like you can either increase or decrease the speed of cell proliferation. And this is al already being deployed by some uh, companies that have found non-deterministically some type of like weak magnetic field that uh, seem to magically, for example, reduce the spread of, of one type of cancer. Like the most famous of these companies is Novocure that produces Optune. This, this company is now valued at $10 billion and they have found a fortuitous magnetic field that happens to downregulate the the, the, to, 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 to actually decrease cell proliferation rates in a very specific type of cancer in a way consistent with this type of, of spin-dependent chemical reaction. It's, it's really crazy because like magnetic field intensities involved are tiny and it seems to work and it's valued at $10 billion. How prevalent is this field of study of uh, uh, quantum-related biology? Are there thousands of researchers around the world or just a handful? Uh... So it's uh, growing. Um, I... I hope your viewers won't, won't see this as a heresy, but I think that quantum biologists today, where quantum computing was, say, 30 years ago, there was a lot of, 30 years ago in quantum computing, there was a lot of theory and not a lot of groundbreaking experiments. I think that right now it's sort of the same. There's a lot of uh, quantum theorists involved in researching quantum biology, but uh, up to now, almost all the experiments have been performed by biologists and chemists. Those experiments are hard. They're beautiful. Uh, so imagine like taking every migration season, taming like 20 birds during migration and, and messing up with the magnetic field. See, th those are hard, right? Those are beautiful. We should respect those type of experiments. They're necessary. And I'm claiming they're not sufficient. I think that the field will advance once we start applying bona fide quantum-like experimental techniques to try to control those uh, quantum degrees of freedom in biological matter in the same way that you would control a spin in diamond, right? So, oh, and, and, and th there's a lot of people uh, in this field. There have been for, uh, again, uh, about for 30 years or so. If you're successful in the lab and the research that you're doing, what do you expect to be able to achieve, say, in five years? 
in five years, I would like to uh, be able to either establish or refute down to a quantifiable noise level uh, the extent to which spin phenomena are like weak magnetic field related to, to spin phenomena uh, can alter cellular function. Either saying, yes, we can see that it's the spin doing this, or saying, no, down to this noise level that is measurable, we don't think it's, it's causal. Um, because I think that this will move the needle, this will make people pay attention, because all the data in quantum biology, for all the flavors of quantum biology, and there are many, it's all correlational. It's either data from chemistry, that there's no doubt there's quantumness there at room temperature, or there is uh, data, macroscopic data that behaves in a correlative way. So where I want to be, in, in not in five years, but maybe in 25 years, so I, I, I want to have an app. I, I'm serious about this. I want to have an app uh, that uh, you can go there and like today you need help with wound healing. For example, wound healing depends on magnetic field in a way consistent with this type of spin-dependent chemical reaction. You go to your app and say, I want, I want to do wound healing. And then you click and your phone produces the exact magnetic field intensity and frequency that you need. And then you, you go with your phone close to your, uh, to your skin. So... Um, the technology to produce those magnetic fields, are it, it, they're already there. You don't need anything else than a cell phone because all you need is the correct strengths and frequency and strengths are weak on the order of those produced by your cell phone. What you need now is the deterministic, if you will, quantum code book on which magnetic field uh, influences which chemical reactions. And for the expert, I, I'm maintaining that what you need is the knowledge of the local spin Hamiltonian to influence each electron spin degrees of freedom for each particular protein, depending on, they are, on what the protein is and where they are in the cell. And for this, you do need those big optical tables, those big synchronized, beautiful uh, quantum experiments. But the end product is, is easy. The hard part is finding this uh, code book. As we get to the end of our conversations today, I wanted to ask you a hypothetical. If you could have dinner with one of the quantum or, I guess, biology greats, dead or alive, who would that person be? Well, wow, that is, that is, that is, um, okay. I used to like Feynman a lot. Now Feynman has, has, Decreased a little bit in my priority uh, scale. I would like to have dinner maybe with Schrodinger to inform him of how the world has evolved. So uh, right now, uh, when I teach my students, I no longer call Schrodinger's equation Schrodinger's equation because Schrodinger was a bad man by a lot of criteria. I teach my students the evolution equation. So I would love to talk to Schrodinger to raise awareness of some of the bad things that he did and uh, that to, to show him that the world is evolving into other more healthy directions towards people who uh, study science and, and uh, yeah, and especially minorities in physics. So Schrodinger, not Tesla. No, no, <laughs> but good one, good one too. A and I, I think I would like to, okay, good one too. I would like to have dinner with both Feynman and Schrodinger and make the same exact comments about minorities in, in physics. Very good. Clarice, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me.